It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Now you can live in Texas and not have a good red meat blend. Texas Cowboy Dust is designed for steak and other red meats. It's out to be my most popular spice blend, made with onions, peppers, ground mushrooms, pink salt, and other spices. Texas Cowboy Dust also goes great with chicken, pork, vegetables, and has a restaurant quality sheen to gravies and sauces. <laughs> It's like a loot machine. All around town, trying to get down. Vanilla smoked sea salt seasoning is for seafood. The tarragon and fennel bring out the natural sweetness in seafood. I also use it in rice dishes, on yams, asparagus, blueberry pancakes, and believe it or not, chocolate chip cookies. Vanilla smoked sea salt adds a salty and savory component to sweet dishes that create a symphony for the tongue. Sugar Chateau Desserts is a specialty bakery located in the Charlotte, North Carolina metro area. We will create delicious and one-of-a-kind treats for any occasion. Sugar Chateau is currently shipping cakes in a jar, offering a variety of different flavors in a single-serve container that can help you celebrate in accordance with social distancing. Place your orders today by calling 803-526-7895 or visiting SugarChateauDesserts.com. True Black Essentials is a retail opportunity to bring black businesses under one roof where every product on every shelf in every aisle will be black owned and black produced by people all over the world. Statistics show that the $1.3 trillion of spending power that we have as black people can easily be turned into each black person having $2 million if we were to shop black for two years. So True Black Essentials will launch an e-commerce store on November 1st, 2020, but we will open up brick and mortar stores in Atlanta, New Orleans, Charlotte, Houston, and Jacksonville with the very first store opening in Atlanta, June 19, 2021. I'm returning to Clinton, Paris, and Tampa's my community. I grew up here, went to school here, and my wife and I make our home here. What makes Tampa special are its people. So when I represent someone injured in my community, it's personal. Call my office and speak to a real lawyer and not some referral service. I will fight the insurance companies to get the settlement that you deserve. At the law office of Clinton, Paris, we take the pain out of being hurt. Ryan Fulford. YT Production. Yeah. I love my HBCU. And boy, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. 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 I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose, yeah. and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. And you gon' learn today, you gon' learn today how your team they play, play, they play, yeah. how they play, boy, you gon' learn today how your team they play, they play, they play, how they play, play, yeah. We represent that swag, that me and let me say, say, what's up the Tennessee, stay, stay, tune into the agency, you sports lab.
This is Dr. Camille with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is out on assignment, so we have Charles Bishop in the show ready to go. Welcome to episode 141 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast, the show that's covering the sporting HBC dash for all things HBC sports. From institutions large and small, from NAIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture and the HBCU athletic aesthetics. We facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs and the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, along with my co-host, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to Case Ways 230 AM studios with Texas Radio Hall of Famer in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Today's episode of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab is sponsored by THD Agency. THD Agency is a company that provides sporting, educational consulting, and data analytics. With that, Charles, let's get, get it out of the air in front of it. You are one of the best in the business. The front, uh, get in front of what goes on. We had a chance to talk a little bit about it. And, uh, man, how you doing? i tell you what, uh, Sunday, whew, that was a good punch. Well, yeah, they, they had to revive me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. They had to revive it, Dr. Neville. That was that was a tough one, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, you tip your cap. You tip your cap to the Southern uh, baseball team uh, to come from uh, the losers bracket, to come from the losers bracket, and come all the way through, and to get that uh, hard stopping win. I tell you what, you, you just take your hats off uh, uh, to them. Uh, they got it done. They got it done They're on the biggest of stages. So all you do is uh, salute, salute Southern Jaguar baseball team, Chris Crenshaw. Uh, guys did a great job in terms of getting the win. No doubt about it. I'm going to shout out to Mobile Threads uh, in terms of what he, Thomas White Jr., in terms of what he got going on, big time fan, uh, even put his sponsorship on the softball dugout for Southern University. All of us, obviously, Carlos Brown, we were going back and forth um, in terms of texting each other on it. So I wanted to give him a shout out in terms of uh, what goes on, Black College experience shout out uh, and to some other ones out there obviously in terms of mo williams uh, um and they were all classy in terms of the way that they wanted in general, in, in general in terms of how they communicated with folks so at least from what i saw directly i, was, I don't know it was few it was few real class <laughs> <laughs> in terms but of you know, no i'm talking about the one that i basically named i ain't oh, yeah. Like, oh yeah oh yeah they, go, they tag you <laughs> as if you didn't watch the game with those score. It was right. crazy. But to your credit, as we get into this a little more in regards to that, is you called it instantly. I thought they were going to rule it the ground rule double. Um, at first, obviously, I thought he caught it. And then I, I have to give a lot of credit to um, the broadcast in terms of how they explain, uh, explain. Yeah. The real credit goes to uh, SWAC office, Dr. Charles. I'm calling in terms of what he got going on there. Um, a lot of, a lot of good things in terms of how they break broke that down was uh, fascinating in terms of what on, went on there. So just wanted to kind of give a shout out a little bit in terms of what they got done. Uh, just looking yeah. at those frameworks. Also wanted to shout out Dr. Jason Cable. Mm -hmm. um, he was the one that asked Charles and said, Hey man, we we're, we're putting in the investment to make sure the kids get a great experience about this. You heard Charles give direct credit in terms of him being able to kind of finalize or initiate the framework uh, of getting the game moved from Jackson to Madison. Um, mm -hmm. and all uh, the coaches, um, the players said it was really a great experience. The fans that were able to get there talked about the environment of playing in such a nice um, stadium in terms of what they look like, baseball field, state of art. And so he pushed and said that there need to be instant replay because they had the access to it, cost a little mm -hmm. more to do it. And, boy, I tell you, imagine <laughs> went down if they had a replay to really decide that because I think if they didn't have it, they probably would have called it the ground rule double. Yeah, I, that was very possible. You know, the first thing that I saw with regards to it, uh, as the left fielder went through the fence, I saw a ball, you know, roll in the bullpen. And my first thought was, I wonder if a ball, if a ball was 
uh, you know, was, was caroming around there in the bullpen if the ball was loose or whatever the case might be. And, you know, you're hoping against hope that the ball is in, in the young man's glove. But, you know, when they right. slowed it down and slowed it down and slowed it down enough, you know, you could see that the ball just uh, tipped over his glove there. You know, tremendous play. But, you know, uh, you know, you, you give credit to Southern. They, they, get, they were able to get a runner on. They were able to get two runners on. And then of all the things, a three-run shot, you know. But, you know, Dr. Kabil, I go back to when the score was 63. And uh, Nicole Galatis was dealing. I mean, he was he was pounding the strike zone, pounding the strike zone. And I think I texted you when the, when the young man did it. Uh, Moore stepped out of the batter's box and just took a breather. And I thought that was so key just to get Galatis out of the rhythm that he was in. And uh, when you talk about, it, I mean, he was just in a rhythm. And when, sometimes when when a pitcher's in a rhythm like that, not only is he pounding the strike zone, pounding the corners, but you know the umpire gets on autopilot too, and everything becomes a strike. So you know, young man stepped out, and sure enough, he hits the home run uh, in the eighth inning and make it six four, just to give Southern an opportunity uh, in the top of the ninth uh, to come up with a rally. But I thought, you know, just the nuance of the game that was so key just to kind of break Gladys out of a rhythm because, you know, for I think seven in a row, he was just dealing. I mean, he was doing his hesitation pitches. He's quick pitching, but, uh, you know, he had the ball rolling on the corner, you know? Oh, you said it instantly. I was like, what are you talking about? Now I realized, oh, uh, he stepped out, and then sure enough, right after that, um, they were able to finally catch up with him. Um, I think some people question on whether you pull, bring in a reliever. I think if you are a baseball guy, right. press the call. Right. This is the pitcher of the year, closer of yeah. the year, right? Yeah. Um, you gave your middle reliever that you said was this humming. You know, it was quick, but he got the hit. So you see if he can go once a day. Yeah. You go to your closer. I think that's yeah. the baseball play to make, and he just didn't have it. I mean, just like yeah. you start one of those days, if you really look at it, the fact that the middle bullpen, which is some of the things people have questioned about Jackson State, they're the reason that they were in the game because just the starter, which was the uh, pitcher of the and year. Sarah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, just didn't have it. Now he was a bulldog. Right. He fought right. through it in terms of keeping them in the game. But you saw them struggling. He was struggling in terms of getting out of those endings. It was amazing to me uh, that he was able to be in that uh, second uh, in that second inning where he only just gave up three three runs there uh, yeah. in terms of early part of it where Jackson State fought right back and got back into it. But uh, kudos to Alabama State in terms of what they did with the game summary. You know, I got into my analytics for baseball, man. I had a summary, individual team stats, leaders. You can go to my Instagram site and I put some of that up there and I can get all inside numbers, who was coming up, how they were playing during the tournament, overall statistics was there. Uh, man, it was just big time. Uh, I was excited about it. Before we go to maybe some other directions, see if there's something else that you want to discuss. Obviously, there's a lot of big news out there. And we'll give a shout out to those that come into the lab and checking us out today in, in terms of that. Arby Parker's in the house. Shout out to him in terms of uh, calling some uh, great play-by-play uh, in terms of SWAC tournament uh, previous to the championship game. Did a wonderful job in terms of his style is extremely entertaining, keeps you laughing in a lot of ways. Um, in terms of that, Charles um, Edmund is really good in terms of his color. And so mm -hmm. I was excited at what Swag did in terms of putting those games on YouTube. You see the reflection of those numbers. Uh, they were off the chart in terms of that. So you can tell how people take Swag baseball seriously when I'm compared to the MEAC. We're going to get in there and talk about congratulations to Norfolk State for their first uh, chance to go to the NCAA tournament, defeating the Eagles that literally not just closed out the season, but closed out the program. Matt. You're yeah. talking about that punch because that went into the levy inning. Um, yeah. Three times in that game, they looked like they had the lead that Norfolk State came back and tied and eventually won in the levy inning. So that was another heartbreak. But I could only watch that on the stats ticket. Mm. giving updates to y'all, which was very different when you got to watch it visually all turning on the build up. And I have some numbers for you there. I know there were some questions in terms of uh, attendance on it, uh, but I did and wanted to get some facts to bring that to some people in terms of that. 
Um, you had um, an average. This is what they average in the thing, 500 a day. But a lot of people don't realize the stadium's so big and you have an overlay, a lot of people are sitting higher to stick, get out of the sun. Sure. Um, so in terms of the camera angle shooting behind the picture, you didn't have a lot of people in the lower section, so it looked empty. Uh, but which was right on par the average that they had when they were previous to New Orleans. Uh, Sunday's championship game had 2,000 fans, which I told a lot of people that I thought Southern and Jaguar fans were going to make their way there, and they did. And so as they did that, that was more fans than you could have put in a Sunday uh, game played in the stadium in uh, New Orleans. So you wouldn't have been able to get all those fans in. So those are some going to do um, talk about what was going on there that I thought people would have some interest in. Any other thoughts that you had on that facility or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought it was a great tournament and to be able to watch the tournament. I think, that, like you mentioned, that was huge. Uh, you know, I was following the, the MEAC tournament, like you said, via the stat tracker, but I was able to watch the SWAT tournament. So I thought, you know, that was big. But uh, to your point, with regards to the Jackson State Southern game, you know, from a baseball perspective, I thought it was the right move. You know, uh, uh, you go back to the top of the ninth inning, and Galatis gives gives up the the single, and uh, you, you go to your you go to your, uh, your your stopper, you go to Deville, and I've seen him uh, this past season get out of a bases loaded jam, I believe, with Louisiana Monroe, uh, where he was able to get to save. You know, he was a save leader for Jackson State. You know, it, it's just one of those things that happened. I know there were some fans pretty frustrated and they were asking why, but I thought. From a managerial standpoint, it was the right move to make. Uh, sometimes the reliever, you know, you 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 hope he comes out there with the water hose, but sometimes they come out there with the gas can, you know, and they just can't put they can't put the fire out. So you know that's that's what happened in this case. And like I said, I continue to tip my cap to Southern because they show championship melt. Uh, they show the pedigree of a championship program. So you know, and they got it done when it had to get done. Yeah, I call it the heart. You heard the heart of the champions. I part part of that phrase and added to it. I say the heart and soul because you know you're in the sweat. You got to have a little bit of soul to get these championships in the sweat. Oh yeah. So many people are fighting for it in different ways. So I call it the heart and soul of a champion. One last thing I'll talk about this um, before we move forward is um, you had some of those game views. You had over seven thousand uh, four hundred people watch one of the games. You had another one that had six thousand people watch the game. Wow. Um, at 5,100 watch another game. Um, the only thing that stood up in terms of some of the watch, top watch matches um, over this last couple of championship period was the SWAC Outdoor Track and Field, which had right under 5,000, 4,966, I believe it was. And then you had another championship game that was 4,918. So you had four of the five games that were broadcast right at uh, 5,000 people or more. Um, so mm -hmm. think about that in terms of the business side of what we look at and what uh, we ask people to consider. That was big time. Just uh, wanted to acknowledge that a little bit because I thought that was fascinating. With that said, are some other news out there that um, you want to get in and potentially discuss uh, that you think um, the listeners would be interested in? Well, I, I thought this was huge news that, that happened uh, the weekend of the SWAG baseball tournament. Almost kind of went under the radar. Uh, but the fact that you had three uh, HBC athletic directors, they, they resigned uh, over the weekend, uh, stallers. Uh, you're talking about Jennifer Lynn Williams at Alabama State in terms of what she was able to do at Alabama State with all the championships Alabama State has had there. You had Jason Horn, he resigned at Xavier. Uh, and then you also had the great Lynn Thompson. Uh, he's leaving Bethune-Cookman at the uh, end of June. So I thought those were uh, significant, moves, significant moves that happened uh, in the HBC universe over the weekend. Yeah, they certainly were significant. Let's talk a little bit more about that. I mean, and it was intriguing because you saw a lot of different people. If you, I mean, the three of them uh, in regards to different stages, different types of programs, one out of the MEAC coming into the SWAC, one in the SWAC, had multiple um, all SWAC trophy programs, uh, won quite a bit in the SWAC in terms of what, when you say all sports, except for the big ones in terms of basketball, football, men, aside for basketball some degree in terms of women as well. So I thought that was intriguing. But Don could have been 30 plus years, Lynn Thomas and what he was able to do. Stalwart. Uh, kudos, another tip of the hat, what he was able to do. And then I think it was fascinating when you talk about Xavier. As you talk about that move there, this is after similar to Bethune Cookman. 
two of the athletic directors are leaving after they transition their athletic program out of one conference into another conference. Obviously, Bethune Cookman University going and leaving the MEAC going into the SWAC. Then you have the Xavier program uh, leaving the Gold Coast Athletic Conference, moving into the Red River Athletic Conference, one at the NCAA Division I level, the other at the NAIA level. So talk about that a little bit. And then obviously Jennifer is making a move and Basketball USA that came out today, courtesy of what I was hearing in a lot of ways, and that was confirmed. So just in that framing, what are your thoughts in terms of athletic directors leaving programs after they make uh, big moves and announcements? Um, any concern or any framing of how that could be challenging to the new individual coming in? Well, I think the, the first thing is, is challenging is uh, they're huge shoes to fill. Uh, when you talk about Lynn Thompson being at Bethune Cookman uh, for 30 plus years uh, and the sort of program that they, they built over at Bethune Cookman, uh, you're talking about uh, championship level football teams, baseball teams, things of that nature. Uh, and then the transition from the MEAC to the SWAC. I think, uh, you know, there's going to be, you know, some potential growing pains in terms of uh, whatever happens in that regard. It's the same thing uh, with uh, Jason Horn uh, at, at Xavier uh, going from uh, their conference to Red River. So, I, I, I you know, I, I think those are going to be some huge shoes to fill and, and you're going to have some – I think what, what you're starting to see is you're going to have some tremendous candidates that are out there uh, in terms of bringing a lot of assets uh, to uh, these jobs in terms of uh, various uh, backgrounds and things of that nature. We've seen, you know, Howard's uh, athletic director come from a completely different framework uh, in terms of uh, working at, HB, uh, at HBO before he came to Howard. So, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm always kind of curious to see what type of candidates will become, uh, you know, will show up on the scene in terms of these AD jobs. Yeah, I think it's going to be fascinating to see, you know, who will be the next person up to lead uh, those respective programs. Um, all of them in really good positions, um, yeah. as we talked about, in terms of the health of the program. So you're not necessarily getting a program that, that you have to take from a bottom, if you would, in terms of multiple sports and competitiveness and things of that nature. So these are, in my opinion, some prime jobs for various different reasons. That very, very much so. Um, the fact that you essentially have, or two of them, it looks like individuals are moving to other opportunities tells you something about those positions. Um, even uh, potentially with all three of them, people are having other opportunities to move on. So that tells you about the space. Uh, um, Going back to the tournament real quickly, I did want to get this out there. Uh, shout out to Michael Ford. He talks about why not have the tournament uh, in Mobile permanently. So I'm not sure if he's talking about Madison or actually wants to go to Mobile. Um, the biggest thing I'll talk about that is when you think about your decision to have a tournament, it's a mutual framework uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and that is for the SWAC office. The coaches are involved. You have the facility. Remember that this game was going to be played in Jackson. Uh, but there were some updates to the facility that were supposed to be made that the SWAC agreed with that, in my understanding, the coaches pointed out were not done. And so at that point, that's when uh, the conference office decided to pick up and move the tournament, and it happened to find a facility that worked. My understanding that the city of Madison went in and supported this and wants to look about bringing it back. And so that's a great incentive. They probably will take it out to bids. So that's what you do in this process when you talk about tournaments. Um, you have the conference office in partnership with the coaches, um, and they talk about locations they want, uh, things that they want to have in the tournament, number of teams, place, the top style of the tournament they want, whether it's double elimination all the way through or not. And those are some things that you have to consider when you talk about that. And in another frame of that is – when you put it out to bid, we're talking about the best bid that goes on. So that's a business component that people need to keep in mind when you talk about why not just go somewhere. You could do that, but if you just go somewhere and they're not interested in the bidding, you're going to pay the full freight of putting your game there, and you won't have any conference in America that really does that framework. They also want – they always want a relationship between the city – um, the sports authority, if they have that kind of, uh, you know, also the council, city council in a lot of ways, they partner up and show that they have an interest in the tournament uh, being there. 
That, that, that actually was a question that I had, uh, Dr. Gill, in terms of uh, what is it that cities need to present in terms of, of, of making that city attractive to host uh, a baseball tournament or a basketball tournament? What are those, what is sort of the framework? Uh, and you mentioned sports authority or whatever the case might be, but uh, what does a city need to do or need to have in place that makes these tournaments uh, uh, or makes a conference tournaments attractive to these uh, uh, cities? Yeah. I'm glad that you brought that up because Michael Ford made sure that he was clear that he was saying move it to Mobile. And so when you talk about that is you put off what you call a FRP, a request for bids. So you put up on these different sites and cities look for these things. And so um, there is a request for bid for different tournaments, basketball tournaments. So SEC does this. They don't just go to a location. They put out a request for bid. The NCA, when they're looking at hosting their various tournaments, they put out a request for bid. Um, you see it with the Final Four. That's one of the biggest things out there, or the Super Bowl. You have these cities that literally put in a year or two package about why their city uh, should be in the bidding. And when you do that, you have to offer incentives. Mm. You don't just say, hey, come and check us out. We're here. We'd love to have you turn. You have to put incentives. So if Mobile uh, does not put in a request for the bid and put in incentives, Nobody in their right mind is going to take their game to a city that is not even doing the minimum framework of putting in a request for bid. You'd be silly. You would literally be paying uh, to put your tournament somewhere and not getting any benefit when there are cities that have an interest. So if you are seeking to have it in a place like Mobile and you have some uh, relationship with your city council, or the sports authority, I would recommend people in their residence area talk to their city officials and say, we want you to get in the business of bidding on a SWAC, MEAC, SIC, um, Big 12, whatever, SEC, whatever you want to call it, Southland Conference. If you want them to get it, you want to ask your city officials to get in that business. Mm. Because no conference in their right mind is going to take a event to a city that wouldn't even have the basic framework to bid on the request to put it there. So I think uh, I'm glad this question and conversation came up because it becomes important. With that, this is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. We're going to take this quick break. We'll be right back after this break and we'll get into some other dialogue and questioning concerns people have if they want to talk a little more deep in that. Uh, and we'll also talk about a couple of other hot news that's out there, including a t in North Carolina Central moving their game to Charlotte, which has some interesting business twists that we need to consider and discuss on um, how that may have come together. And um, it's a little different than the traditional format when we see classics. So it'll be interesting to get a little more dialogue on what's going on there. So stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. This is Brian Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. It was a, a monumental game for a and and Tampa. It was a monumental game. Somebody had to lose, and thank God it was them this time. We knew it was going to be a battle. Look at Jake Avis' record, 202 and 36, I think, some, some un, off the wall figures. And nobody would play him because they didn't want to take a chance of getting beat. But the truth of it is, over 46,000 tickets. Blacks were sitting on in, in the East stands. The whites were sitting in the West stands and the score wound up 34-28. Uh, the only thing we proved that uh, we wasn't inferior, that we were not inferior and we were not afraid. For one night, for 160 minutes, we were better than them. We represent that swag. That me and let me say, say, what's up the Tennessee State State? Tune into the
This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike is out on assignment, so it's Charles and I holding up in the lab. Appreciate it. Keep the questions and comments coming. Some good stuff out there. I know before we went into break, we were going to talk about the move of North Carolina a and the Aggies, the North Carolina Centrals, the Eagles, moving their game from home and home to Charlotte, or maybe not so fast. Um, it looks like they're doing that. Mm-hmm. And so – with that being said, we'll get into it uh, a little bit on that dialogue. Is anything else that you wanted to bring out before we took a deep yeah. dive? Sure. One of our listeners, Jerome Deep Sutton, and he had a really good question here, and it's a TV question. And he wanted to know how long do you have to watch a game on TV to get credit for having watched the game? That's a really good question. In terms of the media side of it, is um, it's it's not just a measure of how long, but it's also when you do it. So that's why a lot of times people would tell you is that if you can keep your television on, even if you have to go somewhere else, because what happens is they send the signals and they read periodically uh, inventory over a region or a city, particularly in terms of that, or across the U S if you would, and they can even do it over the world to some degree. And what they do is they'll take measurements at various times during the day or various times during a game. So they can tell you how many people watch oftentimes at the early part of the game or a latter part of the game. Mm. Indications and they'll take an average of it and put it up there. So um, it's not so much just in terms of how long you have to do it. It's also in terms of when they measure it at a given time, whether you'll be included in terms of the ratings for a television broadcast. And this is more challenging when you talk about the streaming component of it. In some ways, they're still working out how they register the streaming. Obviously, they can do view counts and things of that. So you ping it, they'll register that, and they'll get a count on that. Um, But um, oftentimes, they can tell if you have different devices that are watching. But it still will count in terms of views. Um, So there's different ways that they're measuring uh, those components of it. So the short answer to that is, if you're possible, is what you want to do is just leave it on um, so you can make sure – that the event that you're seeking uh, gets credit for it. Um, and so those are some things that you consider with the television side of it. Even the podcast that you're watching, I'll uh, leave that on too. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Please leave that on. Uh, and if, if you can, I know you watch us live, go to the uh, Facebook side and make sure you subscribe. That's both to BCSN, my BCSN. Subscribe to that because those count numbers are important in terms of multiple ways. If ever there are people that want to pull us up and put us on a different platform, we're going to need to be able to show those algorithms in terms of the number of people watch. Um, Obviously, go to Inside HBC Sports Lab, those algorithms. So we're able to put all that stuff together, the social media accounts that we get on Facebook, the social media accounts we get on Instagram, the social uh, media accounts that we get on Twitter. All those are important when folks are trying to measure uh, the financial side and worth of your show. And so um, those are things um, that uh, happen in regards to real life in terms of what you see as value. But if we want to be able to show this as value to somebody else, we need to be able to show those numbers. And I'll be upfront with you. If we get those opportunities, all we're going to do is invest it back in the show to be able to give you more premium uh, platforms. Uh, be able to travel, give you more live frameworks in terms of what that looks like uh, at a different uh, time. So appreciate those questions. Appreciate the support. Um, important uh, things that we're doing. Like, share, absolutely. Tag folks, those that allow you to do that. Getting back to Lonnie Shaw, he talks a little bit more in terms of don't know what kind of deal was struck in Charlotte officials, but a t came in well overdue in Charlotte. Big South headquarters is in Charlotte. And I wonder, did they have anything to do with it? That's a good point. I wouldn't be surprised if Big South had something to do with it. Uh, certainly, um, they weren't against it. Uh, we know that much about it. Um, the the eight athletic directors, VP of Athletics at North Carolina a t North Carolina Central, very sharp um, individuals. So I'm sure uh, that this was a significant business deal. What I think is interesting that is different, though, it's not, they're not making this an annual pilgrimage to Charlotte every year, which you see in a lot of classics, which was done with this game. And while in some ways they say coming back to Charlotte, people forgot or may have forgotten 
similar to Jackson and Alcorn is they went back to campus, moving it from um, a one location. They're coming back to Charlotte because it's previous where they played the class for a long time. Uh, but I'm sure there are incentives in terms of playing this game there. It'll be interesting to see what is the rental fee of the stadium. A lot of people are intrigued about that. The play in these stadiums, they're pretty costly. I know at one time, for example, the play in NRG, uh, playing some of these NFL venues, they're a million dollars just up front. And that's basically uh, without any of the thrills associated with it. Um, and they'll put it up. A lot of times the way they do these deals, you put up, up that front money uh, uh, to do it. And what they'll do is they'll take money out your ticket sale and then based on where your gross and net is will determine whether you have to pay some or whether they write you a check. Most of the time with a crowd of about anywhere from 25, 30,000, you're able to generate some significant income uh, off of a game in a central location like that. Um, and now, now this is outside of the promoter side, because remember the promoter side, the promoter takes on that responsibility of paying all the upfront costs. And then they just write a check to the schools and ask the schools essentially to show up. So there's different formulas of how this can work. And sometimes you can go to a city uh, it's this partnership between several entities. You have, the, it looks like the 100 Black Men of Charlotte in that area uh, that are involved from a nonprofit organization side. It looks like you have a um, entity that will help with the marketing side of this. And then you have the local sports authority. So I'm sure they put in some funds associated with supporting this. And so those are things that you want to consider when you're looking at this and not saying that this is good, bad, and or in different type of mood, but just giving people some perspective of how these things must come together when you play it out. I was curious about the significance of going to Charlotte in 2022 and then in 2027. Is there any significance as to uh, the particular years, if there is a, a cost differential or whatever the case might be as to why you go back to Charlotte in those years? Yeah, I would, I would lean on some of my Aggie uh, fans in the lab out there, Lonnie Shaw pretty much was up front and says that he's still looking into it. But this is what I will tell you, that these are some of the things that you would want to want to consider. Um, and we're not saying that these are specific things that I've talked to any of the individuals involved. But as you talk about it, um, one thing is, is, was the facility available? This is my understanding they want to play at Labor Day weekend in 2022. One thing that you have to consider, is the facility available? Remember, um, the Carolina Panthers are the resident officials of that facility. And then you don't know if there are other organizations that have booked things in there, you know, soccer matches and things of that nature, international types of games. You got to think about, is the facility available, which would, could be one component of it, is that they may want to stick to a certain date. And that date may have not been available every year. There may be a framing where they're trying to set this up in such a way that they want to make this like a um, five-year experience. Where mm. it's there five years and they play at home, home and away, and then the next five years they come back. And so maybe they're trying to build this buildup, if you would, in terms of anticipation that you are still having the ability to have the home game component of it, which obviously the coaches would love that they still get to play a couple of games at home. But then you have the experience of taking it out and playing in this um, regional game, which means that you also have the ability to reach out to uh, where you will recruit a lot of your, not only your athletes, but a lot of your students in the Charlotte, which is a major metropolitan area, obviously in North Carolina. So anytime you can get your footprint in there to show your face, show your brands of your institution is always good for recruiting which is something I'll talk about, making sure that you uh, look strategically about your game. That's one thing that's good about going to Atlanta, uh, mm -hmm. having that a large metropolitan area uh, that is a natural fit for a lot of recruiting ground for not just athletes, but students in general. That's why playing in Dallas for Prairie View and Grambling makes some sense in terms of a large recruiting ground. That's why Southern and Texas Southern also look to get into Dallas so they can play in that game. It's a reason why Langston, uh, after their cost was paid for, brought their band to play. It's my understanding they might get an invite back next year to play in the State Fair Classic. 
And mm-hmm. so part of this that you're using that we talk about athletics as the front porch of your institution is also about enrollment. This biggest thing that we talked about last year, so big part of athletics is your enrollment. We mm-hmm. must not forget that. So however you can drive enrollment is the important component of this. So I'd imagine that there's probably some of this in that as well. So those are things that you want to consider about um, why they might have chosen this format versus every year format. The, with, with this format, would, do you think that this Aggie Eagle Classic has the ability to morph itself into uh, something as big as the Florida Classic or the, or the Magic City Classic or the Bayou Classic? I certainly think it can. Uh, I think, but those things take a long time. So you're talking about a long time. I don't think you're going to get, unless you're going to put a lot of money up front. And most of our institutions are not in the business of investing in events uh, over a period of time to see them grow. Um, They'll do it periodically, if you would, but periodically, I'm saying. But it's like the Southern Heritage Classic. Think about how long it took for that to grow. Sure. In tradition it is. And so, uh, you know, State Fair Classic. The Bayou Classic, even though it's pretty solid now, the first year it was big, but it had its little dips and now it's going up. It takes Florida Classic. It takes time to prime these events to get them where you are, where you have this serious event framing of it. Because what really sells folks outside of what you would have with your normal crowd going to a home game is the event. So you're trying to bring more ancillary people that traditionally probably would not go to this game if it was on campus. So you're trying to add on to that. And to do that, you must turn it into a event. Now, I know some of the purists out there in terms of fans of just the game uh, in itself or just the bands to some or may have some concern about that. But if you really think about it, while we celebrate some of these bigger programs or even professional entities, what they have done to really get is what they seek is to build their brand out. I told you a couple of weeks ago about marketing and getting people up the escalator, right? And marketing, which is about saying a set thing and then you can create a bit atmosphere around it to move you up that escalator. And all you're doing is you're getting fans that traditionally wouldn't watch it to watch it. Football, if you want to talk about the NFL, it's not the biggest beast out there because everybody's a football fan. They've turned Sunday and other days of the week, in particular the Super Bowl, if you really want to focus on it, they turn it into a major event. Sure. It's not the game. The game just makes it like anything else. It's everything mm-hmm. surrounding it. But the problem is, is you have to have the investment, not just the foresight. A lot of our athletic directors, presidents, chancellors, VPs of athletics have the foresight. But the problem is, is do you have the revenue up front to invest in it to get it where it needs to go? And that's the problem or the challenge you have is about really understanding where do you get your investment money to do that? Uh, to take the chance to really create these events around these games. And that just takes a period of time. So those are things that you really need to consider when you go into the business of it like that. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt about it. Very, very, very fascinating um, uh, subject matter and a lot of great questions in here uh, in terms of uh, looking at this Aggie Classic. Yeah, good. Uh, pull them out. You got a question in some of them you want to pull out that you saw? It? Well, Stephen Miller saying they should partner with ESPN events and get these games on, on one of the ESPN networks. So I thought, you know. Uh, that, that's a <laughs> great point. And I think ESPN is totally doing that. Um, in terms of that, you got that with the Tuskegee Classic that they talked about, right? That's going to feature mm-hmm. Tuskegee Crowd. Um, in terms of them getting into business, or what is Tuskegee? Um, all in state, I believe it is actually. Um, but yeah, but you got to understand, you know, there's one side of that about get ESPN events involved, uh, but then when they do it, they take over everything and they, they have a lot of things that they want to see done. So you got to be prepared for that. So we got some fans that like the idea of ESPN events and like the idea of ESPN, but you have some fans do not like the intrusiveness of ESPN. So it's a give and take about what that looks like. Uh, but that is an option to sell it to an event. So if you think about ESPN events, ESPN events is the promotion side. It's, it's simply a promoter. It's the promotion side of ESPN. But it's a brilliant move by ESPN to create ESPN events because that's what ESPN is looking for, right? They're looking for yeah. immigrants. They're looking for it. 
So sometimes you go and create your own inventory. You don't always mm -hmm. have to go buy it from the NBA or, you know, purchase it from the SEC, purchase it from the SWAC. You go and create it yourself, which is essentially what the MEAC SWAC challenge was, essentially what the celebration was. They created an event that they believed a lot of people would have interest in, um, and then you market towards that event. So great point in terms of that being an option uh, in terms of what that looks like. Uh, particular event uh, at that level. And as I see ESPN probably getting more into the HBCU business than they are, I can see that as a, a viable option when you think about it. Sure thing, sure thing. Well, um, I, go ahead. No, I, I tell you, I mean, so much other news to get into and uh, uh, getting the inbox here to make sure that you mention uh, about uh, Alabama AM getting richer. They received, uh, they were able to get into the transport portal and a former LSU receiver, he'll be joining uh, Alabama A&M. So I think that was a, a huge get for Alabama A&M. D. Anderson, he will be transferring to Alabama A&M. Uh, you got Quincy Case coming over from Jackson State to Alabama A&M. So, you know, the Bulldogs, are, they're right in the business of, 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 of staying at the top of the Swag East, if you will. Well, I, I think that's the, the same thing that we talked about earlier with Southern, tipping our cap. That's what happens when you win the championship. You have a chance in this championship, even though a lot of people are claiming or uh, 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 complaining, I should say, about them only playing four or five games. But they maximized their exposure for those four or five Yeah. Games. They time. were on ESPN2, ESPN um, in those games in terms of what they were able to do. They showed out really well. They ultimately won a championship. So this is an indication that I tried to explain to folks is that you got to understand of moving away from just being competitive on the field. That's one phase of it. But the other phase of it is understanding the marketing and the branding of the opportunities you get um, in these spaces. So they maximize this opportunity because some teams are losing players out of the port. Um, Alcorn State, we're not playing. And you never know how much of that um, were parts of that indication? It's my understanding Prairie View has lost some players in the portal. You know, what does all this mean? There's a transaction, so there's the good, bad, and indifferent, but you got to understand that when you have your opportunity, you got to maximize it and make the most of it, and that's what Alabama A&M is doing in regard to what's going on now. And so that's going to be fascinating. You see FAMU? They've been able to find a way to strategize, even though they're not playing, by keeping their brand out there in terms of engaging their alumni, talking about this move to the SWAC. Uh, they've been very upfront doing different fundraising activities all over social media platforms. Uh, the coach has been engaged on social media platforms. So even though they didn't play, you did not lose that much space about them being out in terms of the dialogue. They even created the conversation about the recruiting between Jackson State and FAMU, recruiting between Jackson State and Alabama A&M. If you think about that, that's the things that kind of fester at the Power 5 schools level. So you're getting into that play where I talked about earlier is the interchange about the dialogue between these programs is extremely important. And people didn't quite listen to understanding what I'm talking about. It's not just so much about Dion, it's about the profile of what Dion helps take place at Jackson State and how that higher profile synergy across different programs play. And if you think about those two coaches are very engaging coaches on the social media platform. That's a question. Yeah. That is a multiplier effect in terms of what we're talking about here. That's a question I want to ask because uh, and, and you get this a lot, especially – uh, football players who played in the 80s, 90s, you know, ah, too much social media, too much, too much. Are we at a place now where coaches have to be actively engaged on social media? I think it's going to be challenging not to be engaged, or at least having somebody on your staff that is really good at it. I'm not sure how you can sustain yourself in the marketplace without doing it. Um, obviously, you can just win. You know, winning is a cure-all in just about anything. So if you can find a way to win above all, but the question is, is part of winning is getting talent. So how are you going to get that talent? Um, and so there are so many multiple variables, but yes, I believe fundamentally you have to find a way to be engaged um, on the social media platform. 
I think there's also a need to be engaged, whether it's on radio, coming on shows like this to stay engaged. Look how much um, output that Alabama A&M coach Manor was able to do about yeah. saying certain things in the media space, coming on. And this is something that he, in my opinion, calculated when we talked yeah. to him. You know, he had a busy right. schedule, but he made time uh, when there was an opportunity to access to get on a media platform that he believed had his fans out there. And these things are going viral literally all over the world. And so that puts him out front and center when he does that. And so those are the things that you got to understand that are extremely important when you have those uh, opportunities to do that um, in, in some way. So that that's the fascinating things about what's going on here in so many different ways. Yeah, and you and you mentioned off one. You you talk about the transfer portal that giveth and it taketh away Quinterio Cole. He's an all swag defensive back. Uh, he's going down to Louisville. So you know and that was a, a, a great article at ESPN this past week about the transfer portal and the coaches' interaction within the transfer portal. So uh, it's going to be very interesting as we move forward here within uh, with regards to uh, players now having the ability uh, to to take more control. Uh, of their uh, of the right situation uh, that, that works best for them. No doubt about it. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back out of this break. As we come out of this, we'll touch a little bit more about that transfer portal. ESPN had an article on there with the coaches complaining, and but I want to tell you how they were complaining because it will be a little different than maybe you thought about, uh, which uh, Carlos Brown will tell you in this group that we text in to give updates and ideas and stay on top of things. I told them from the very bottom when so many people were digging on the players, I said, that's not really your problem. And you don't even realize your problem is staring you right in the face. Stick with mm. us and that problem is when we come back outside of this break. Have you had your Earth Blend coffee today? At Earth Blend Coffee, we take pride in offering you the very best of beans across the world blended and roasted to perfection, giving you superior quality and satisfying and flavorful taste. Experience the world in one cup with Earth Blend Coffee. Let's face it, shopping for insurance can be time consuming. That's why when it comes to your auto, home, and life insurance needs, Make things simple and trust the experts at Allstate. They will help you get the coverage that fits your needs while helping you bundle your life, home, and auto policies. Bundling saves you money, sure, but it also saves you time so you can enjoy the things that matter most even more. Contact me, Tammy Haynes, your local agent, for a free personalized insurance quote. Allstate. Are you in good hands? How they play, boy, you gon' learn today. How they play, they play, they play. How they play, play, yeah. We represent that swag, that me yag. And let me say, say, what's up to Tennessee? Stay, stay. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. As we come with the final phase of our show, wanted to get back into that article that I teased about. And I see some people did get a chance to check it out. And yes, the term they used was coaches poaching players. And I told a lot of people, everybody is always talking about these um, players and their rights and what they should and should not do and all these things. You'd be surprised at how many of these coaches out here uh, recruiting players uh, from other teams. And, and so sometimes when you point that finger, it's three coming right back at you. And that's sure. one of the um, and so if people hadn't seen by now, I'm all an uh, advocate for players. Um, uh, whether at the professional level, college level, I don't care, peewee level, whatever, amateur level. Um, because my thing is, is so many people are making their money off of these players, right? Correct. And we turn a blind eye to that. And we act like all these folks that are making the money are good people. And all of them are not necessarily good people. So... We've seen horror stories and why we have, in a lot of ways, lionized coaches, and many of them were great to the right. But uh, the day of all of them being great, if there ever was such a thing, to me, is long gone. Um, and so I thought it was fascinating. And the second part of it, they did talk about players empowering themselves and how players are recruiting um, other players. 
And they tried to put it on LeBron James, and I thought that was intriguing, <laughs> always jumping on his back. But players have recruited players since you can remember. Of course. Um, of and course. so that wasn't anything LeBron should get any additional credit for, even though I understand why people did it, because he did it in the most broad sense of the way. And even if that was the case, I don't have a problem with that. I think you, this is your one opportunity that you have uh, to participate in a sport. Um, and so if you want to go enjoy it with a friend, a high school friend or whatever, I think it's great. Uh, the biggest thing is make sure that you are understanding what you're getting into in terms of the institution you're going to, that it has the academic programs that you're looking at. Does it have opportunities post a graduation that sets you up for success? And does it have a culture that you can be comfortable with that the day that you have to step off a field that you can still survive in such a way that you'll be happy? Those are things that I tell people to, to think about. And obviously, uh, the financial disposition of earning a scholarship, whether it's academic or athletic, um, I think is certainly a benefit. And you need to consider all those things. Why do you think fans, um, for lack of better words, they, they line at, lionize the athlete? Uh, for using uh, their platform, or not using their platform, but but having the ability to move around, uh, whether it's in the pros, you're talking about free agency. Now we're talking about players in the transfer portal. We're starting to see in high school now uh, guys take off their senior year to prepare for college, and that has been a, a hot topic as well in terms of uh, those four or five star athletes at least uh, utilizing their ability to take control of themselves. Man, I think that's a great dialogue when we get into it. Is this, it goes back to the fact for the longest time we have really lionized coaches. We've made coaches gods uh, in so many days. We've marketed coaches to be the end all and be all. So for years in this society, we've suggested that coaches knew best. They had all the answers and they had all the good intentions. And so if you of that framework, or you have been told that for so many years, it's hard to believe that a player could be good if they're not listening or doing directly what the coach says. Um, and so that's part and partial. Um, and over the years, if you look at the NFL that has done such a brand and component of marketing, one of the days they were way, uh, able to market was not just insinuating what's going on with the positive of their teams, but also if they've done some negative framework too about belittling players in such a way of taking away their power, which depresses their financial uh, position in such a way that it helps the organization make more money. So this goes in a lot of ways is the platform of capitalism that talks about someone has to win and for someone to win, someone has to lose. So that's kind of the way that we've seen society both on the field, literally in terms of wins and losses, to off the field in a lot of ways in terms of who should get it uh, and who shouldn't, who should uh, take it <laughs> in a lot of ways is what you get. And that's the framing of what goes on here. So as you look at that, it gets us into this component that I also wanted to talk about, that, that the SWAT game since MEAC championship was completed on Sunday, baseball championship with Norfolk defeating North Carolina Central ending – of the season there, and kudos again to Norfolk State getting it done in the 11th inning on a walk-off. Um, that was just uh, crazy to see the pitchers after the fact. Uh, kudos to that program. It'll be fascinating to see how that may propel Norfolk State moving forward if MEAC is able to continue with uh, baseball over the next two or three years as they um, are seeing some of the teams leave, whether it's uh, to another conference or a program shutting down. So those are some things there. Obviously, you had Alabama State and Morgan State. Um, they lose respectively in the regionals. Alabama State lost to Troy uh, in terms of wrapping up in their last game, double elimination, so two losses there in terms of what they look like. And then Morgan State losing their last, last game in terms of Texas A&M as they come out of that region. But one of the things that was fascinating in terms of what you've seen take place in the MEAC, that was the closing of 50-year anniversary. That is the last – athletic event from a conference office perspective. Obviously, we got track and field, and we'll get a chance to get in a little more of that on Thursday. We'll really get in a chance to talk about what a and is doing and the magics that they are taking and the number of folks that they have qualified. We'll take a deeper dive on that Thursday. Credit to the Aggies 
but I wanted to give them more time to really get in track and field. But the other reason I did that is in a lot of ways, um, most of the folks that are going to regionals are going as independent. Now, a t has a slight different approach because they have so many folks going that they're going to be in running for a team championship in some ways. So that's going to be fascinating to see if they can get that done. But generally speaking, um, at HBCUs, you start seeing the individuals. So in terms of the conference office putting the tournament together, that was the last one. And so it booked in 50 years for the MEAC and booked in 100 years for the SWAC. So think wow. about how 100 years ended uh, with two of the biggest rivals in the conference uh, playing it up for a championship to close out literally the 100-year chapters as we go into 101 with the expansion era from 1920 to 2020. I thought that was really framed in my mind in so many different ways. And I was like, wow, what a way to end 100 years of history uh, to catapult us into 101 or end 50 years of history for the MEAC into 51. So that was fascinating. So I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on me framing it that way that I'm not sure I've heard anybody else really put out there. Yeah, I, I guess I, I did not think uh, about that being the uh, the final event of the 100th uh, year of the Southwestern Athletic Conference or, or the same with regards to the 50th year of the uh, Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. But, you know, uh, in both regards, what are 50 years for the MEAC <laughs> and, and what are 100 years for the SWAC? I mean, uh, uh, for me, for, for growing up in, within the, the footprint of Southwestern Athletic Conference, uh, so many great memories, whether you're talking about football, basketball, track, softball, whatever the case might be. Uh, so much of my childhood through adulthood has been focused in on this conference and the players around it. So uh, that's fascinating that you put it in that framework uh, that that closes out a hundred year chapter of Southwestern Athletic Conference. And I can't wait to 101. That's going to oh be my, my at 101. <laughs> And I'll put one out to hashtag 51. But, yeah, uh, 101 is going to be fascinating to see what's going on. I did want to uh, point this out. And we talked about this a little bit with our last guest last Thursday. Southern University head coach Robert Bob Lee has been selected and inducted into the National College Baseball Hall of Fame. We can't celebrate that enough, although we talked about it last week. Um, he won NIA championship in 1959 with Lou Brock leading the way and a lot of other excellent players on their team. Um, Lee's overall record was 172 and 35, 83 winning percentage. Think about that over 13 years uh, in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. And other than these independents, some of those conference records for baseball are lost during the time that he was in there. You know, we mm. start in the modern era of what I call the SWAC, where you start seeing the records outside of football records, you start seeing in late 50s. So a lot of these things uh, culminated, uh, hopefully by the record keepers at Southern University. It looks like they did some good job. But following year in 1960, Lee again led Southern to the NA National Tournament and finished third. 1961, he was named the NIA National Coach of the Year. And he was elected to the NIA Hall of Fame in 1967. And so those are some Fascinating things when you just talk about a legendary uh, coach in terms of a, at a time that we don't necessarily focus on because we're modernized in so many different ways. But uh, I wanted to close on that note. That'll do it for our show today. This is Dr. Gaville inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, and Charles Bishop. I uh, hope you enjoyed the hour with us today. Thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast. With your friends and colleagues, I am Dr. Ginyata Kaville, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. We hope you enjoyed the interview as we just talk back and forth with each other in regards to some of the questions coming from our fans. Shout out to the lab, listeners out there giving us uh, with all this great information out there. Shout out to Fred Whitty in the football history. Uh, make sure you go get the encyclopedia. One, support those that are going to write your history. And these are things that you need to get your hands on quickly because I know a lot of y'all got the facts out there, but this is another way that you can make sure that you have those information and you can shout up as we go on through the show. You can bring up some of these facts and figures as we're talking about some of the modern stuff. So go out there and check out Fred Whitty and get your hands on the uh, football history encyclopedia, if you will. We hope you enjoyed the, uh, the show. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Mills Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watson, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday. 
right here at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, inside the HBC Sports Lab. One on Twitter, inside the HBC Sports Lab, on Facebook and YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, as we said earlier. Dream big and we'll continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Of course, Charles. Lecture. Dismiss. YT Production. <laughs>yeah i love my hbcu and boy i love it love it i love it love it i love my hbcu and man i hope my team they won one yeah i hope my team they won one yeah man i hope my team they won one i hope my team they won one yeah I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team wanna lose. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. And you gon' learn today, you gon' learn today, how your team they play, they play, they play, yeah. how they play, boy, you gon' learn today, how your team they play, they play, they play, how they play, play, yeah. We represent that swag, that meag, and let me say, say, what's up to